you now have a good knowledge of the fundamentals of quantum information, such as superposition, measurement, and entanglement. I hope it is clear at this point how powerful quantum computing can be compared to classical computing. We will now discuss the more practical or experimental aspects of quantum computing by providing an overview of where this field of research is nowadays. The first questions you might have asked yourself are, why building a quantum computer? And are quantum computers going to replace the computers we currently use? As you might have heard several times, quantum computers will be capable of solving some complex problems that are intractable even for the most powerful supercomputers. They promise to achieve up to exponential speedups compared to classical computers. And by classical computers, I mean the computers we will use today. However, it is not that quantum computers will replace classical systems, but they will be much faster at solving some specific problems, such as the ones related to simulation and optimization. This will allow, for instance, to improve the materials used for building airplanes or for solar cells, to develop better car batteries, or even the discovery and development of new drugs. In addition, quantum computing will potentially impact other industries such as logistics by solving the well-known traveling sales mal problem or the financial sector thanks to the similarities between quantum and the financial modeling. One of the most famous examples at which quantum computer can excel, though not the most realistic one in the short term, is its application to encryption and decryption of data. Thanks to its ability to factorize large numbers, it is said that if a universal and larger scale quantum computer is built, it will break one of the most widely used systems in cybersecurity called RSA. Let's now talk about the progress of quantum computing. Although quantum computers are almost every week in news, the idea of building a quantum computer is not something recent. It was in 1981 when the physicist Richard Feynman, during his seminal lecture Simulating Physics with Computers, proposed to build a new kind of computer, a quantum computer for simulating quantum mechanics. Since then, the field has experienced a remarkable progress that goes from the development of the first quantum algorithms in the early 90s, such as the Schurz algorithm for factorization of numbers, till the creation of the first company dedicated to the fabrication and delivery of quantum computing systems. The wave launched in 2011 the first commercial quantum computer called D1, D-Wave 1, that runs on a 128-qubit processor. It has to be mentioned that these computers are based on quantum annealing. Nowadays, there are different quantum technologies that are being explored and used for the implementation of qubits. Some examples are superconducting qubits, trapped ions, quantum dots, MB centers, or Majorana qubits. As we will see later, we are in the NISC era in which error-prone quantum processors consisting of a few tens of qubits already exist. Some of them are accessible through the cloud, such as the IBM quantum chips, in which users can run small quantum algorithms through the IBM quantum experience platform. One of the most recent breakthroughs in quantum computing was the experiment run by the Google team in 2019 in which they claim to have demonstrated the so-called quantum supremacy. This term refers to quantum computers being able to solve a problem that a classical computer cannot. To this purpose, they use their 54 Sycamore processor. It is expected that in the near future, the number of qubits per chip will substantially increase to integrate hundreds of qubits. Finally, let me mention that the quantum inspired platform developed at QTech, in which users can perform their computation on two different uh, quantum processors based on superconducting qubits and spin qubits. 
As I mentioned previously, we are now in the noisy intermediate scale quantum era, or just NISC era. This term that was introduced by John Perskill refers to the current quantum processors and the ones that will be developed in the near future. Intermediate defines the number of qubits in the chip that ranges from 50 to a few hundred, whereas noisy emphasizes the fact that such a processor is error-prone. In this NISC state, a unique difference of quantum computing compared to classical computing is that currently several quantum bit implementations are being explored and developed, each of them having a specific characteristics. However, what is common to all of them is their fragility. As you may know, qubits can easily lose their information just through the interaction with the environment. Here, you can see some of the most relevant properties of qubits, that are the coherence time or qubit lifetime, that is, the time a qubit can hold a quantum state, the gate fidelity, that refers how accurate a gate can be performed, the gate operation time, or how long a gate takes to execute, and the qubit's connectivity, as well as their scalability and maturity. Although some of them seem to be more promising candidates, there is no clear case yet on which alternative will outperform others. As we have shown before, several quantum algorithms already existed in the early 19s. They promised from polynomial to exponential speedups compared to their classical counterparts. Although we will have to wait to have a universal fault tolerant quantum computer to demonstrate their full potential, with current quantum processors, we can already run some algorithms that follow a hybrid approach, in which a quantum processor is combined with a classical processor. Intuitively, because a large portion of the computation is executed on the classical solver, deep quantum circuits might not be required. This kind of algorithms usually use parameterized quantum circuits whose parameters are updated in each iteration. Some popular hybrid quantum classical algorithms are the Quantum Variational Eigensolver, or BQE, and the Quantum Approximate Optimization Algorithm, or QAOA. The maturity of some quantum devices in terms of qubit count and controllability, together with the ability of near-term applications, has allowed the development of the so-called full stacks, that bridge quantum applications with quantum processors. What these higher layers of the stack allow is to express a quantum algorithm in a high-level language that is further translated in a quantum circuit by the compiler. This circuit is decomposed, optimized, and mapped to a given quantum device. The resulting circuit is then translated into a series of low-level instructions and ultimately to their corresponding pulses that operate on the quantum device. This figure illustrates the levels of abstraction for a quantum computer system. As in classical computers, the top levels correspond to the software, whereas the bottom ones are part of the quantum hardware of the computer. Please note that quantum error correction will be required for being able to perform fault tolerant computations. You may now wonder how this full stack quantum system looks in reality. Or in other words, how does a real quantum computer look like? This picture shows exactly that, a real quantum computer. Let's have a closer look at it going bottom-up in the full stack. Quantum processors usually only function at very low temperatures, around 20 millikelvins, which is close to absolute zero, although some of them can work at slightly higher temperatures. That is why quantum chips are placed at the coldest part of the cryostat that is inside a big fridge. As you can observe, at the top part of the fridge, there are a bunch of wires or cables that connect the quantum chip with the classical control devices that are at room temperature. These devices are used for controlling and operating the qubits. So, a quantum program written in a normal PC can be executed on the quantum processor by sending the corresponding signals to operate on it.